the bell tolls 530. Uh, not much new in the way of announcements. I will say that I saw four of the five flow codes this afternoon and they were all doing well. Anna was resting, uh, but they wanted to pass along the, uh, their thanks for all the prayers and support that they've received over the last week now. So uh, thank you all for that. Uh, so if there are no other announcements, let's uh, prepare our hearts to serve uh, our Lord. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 75, verse 1. We give you thanks, O God. We give thanks, for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. Please turn in your Trinity Psalter Psalter hymnal to our opening hymn, 403. Glorious things of thee are spoken.
on this your Sabbath day. May our utmost desire be to worship you. Please hear our confessions, our praises, our singing, and our prayers as we praise and worship you. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and you alone in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive us that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways in the glory of your holy name. Amen. Please be seated. Please turn in uh, your copy of the Trinity hymnal to page 878. As you recall from this morning, when we read through the Apostles' Creed, we're also going through that portion uh, of the Heidelberg Confession. So it's uh, Lord's Day 14th, and we will read responsibly. What does it mean that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary? That the eternal Son of God, who is and remains true and eternal, took to himself through the working of the Holy Spirit from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, a true human nature, so that he might also become David's true descendant, like his brothers in all things except for sin. How does the holy conception and birth of Christ benefit you? He is our mediator, and in God's sight, he covers with his innocence and perfect holiness my sin in which I was conceived. Praise be to God. We come now to prayers for the church, and I will uh, read through several prayers that I have, but I would also like to uh, elicit any prayers that, that you may have um, in the congregation. So, Troy. What's her name, Troy? Allison. Allison. Do we know if she's a believer? She is. Okay. Anything else? Neil. Absolutely. Anything else? Bob, I think we've got a for the church plant uh, down in uh, Charlotte Trinity Chapel with Pastor Keith Ginn. That's a word of blessing and um, bring folks that the gospel uh, would be further proclaimed down there in the wedding tent. We've got several church plants going on right now, don't we? We've got the one in Belmont with Mr. Forbes, Pastor Forbes, and then the, the plant out of um, Hendersonville. Anything else? And all of those would be in our presbytery, correct? Yeah, so that's great. Anything else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as was said this morning, we look outside and see your beautiful creation. We are deeply thankful for these small glimpses of the garden 
and an even smaller glimpse of heaven. We understand this will, world will end, though we know not when. May we never lose sight that we are merely sojourners on a glorious, though sometimes arduous, pil pilgrimage to be with you in heaven. <laughs> Father, we pray for our missionaries around the world who proclaim your Son as the only way to eternal life in heaven. We pray especially for Josh and Ashley Grimm and family and the ministry they have with students at Queens in Charlotte. We thank you for the leadership Josh provides in RUF and the various other campus ministries in which he and Ashley uh, participate in. <laughs> Father, we pray again for Micah Serafini and his planned surgery in early summer. Father, this young man is a light in every room he enters. I pray that your will is that this difficult surgery will be successful and his body will be able to use the energy now being spent on his illness to grow him physically and that you will use him mightily for Christ. Please comfort and give wisdom to Johnny and Nadine as they make sometimes difficult decisions. May they remember that you hold Michael in your hands. Father, we're thankful for the birth of yet another covenant child, Salika Holoko to Alex and Anna. This was a long and difficult labor, and we pray for rest, especially for Anna, as she and Alex bond with Salika. We continue to pray for Tim Watson. We pray that his new doctors will be able to determine the cause for his illness so that a cure can be found. We pray that you hold him up both physically and spiritually. Father, we pray for Troy's aunt in Florida, Allison, uh, who has been diagnosed with kidney failure. Father, we are thankful that, that she is a believer, and we just, we just pray that you would be with the physicians, um, that they would be able to um, cure, her, cure her of this disease. Father, we pray for uh, the continuing work of our search committee, uh, Lord, this has been a long process, um, but Father, we're, we can have confidence to know that you know the man that you want uh, behind this pulpit uh, assisting uh, Pastor Maury. Father, we pray for uh, all of the uh, church plants uh, in the ARP, particularly in this, um, in this presbytery. Lord, we pray for... Keith Ginn, Trinity Chapel, uh, we pray for, for that work, the, uh, the work, uh, the, the plant that's um, coming out of Henderson, Hendersonville, uh, North Carolina. And um, Father, we just uh, pray for uh, the spread of your gospel. We, th we, we thank you for, the, for all of these works. Uh, Lord, we know that you hear and you answer every single prayer that we send up. And it's in your son's precious and holy name that I pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. We come now to some congregational hymn selections. We'll do maybe three or four. Maybe first and last verse. So, do I have any uh, suggestions? Paula. 100 B. 100 B. Wasn't expecting a song for a first selection. Good for you. Oh. 
65. <clears throat> Those were kind of short. Let's do all four verses.
We spent a good many months in the book of Acts. It is uh, called the Acts of the Apostles, but really it's the act of God himself in building up his church. So I thought we might go to uh, a place where uh, there is more specific instruction with regard to uh, how the church is to be built up and established. And so I thought we would look at First Timothy over the next few many weeks. So the question before us as we start our study is how are we to think of ourselves as the church? How are we to think of ourselves as the church? You might uh, consider some various views of the church. Certainly liberalism says that the gospel won't work and uh, therefore we need to change the message. Other groups might say, particularly in modern evangelical churches, oftentimes they would say the gospel won't work unless our methods are changed. So you change the message or you change the method. But I, but I clearly believe that the Bible is clear, that the gospel does work, and that God has given us a method and a message to build the church. So as we come to our study of First Timothy, Paul has given uh, his understudy, Timothy, some instruction on how it is that the church is to be put together. And so Paul, uh, in his pastoral epistles or letters, are written certainly to individuals, but they are to be understood and meant for congregations like ours, for example, as well as that which is of the early church. If you look at uh, the third chapter, verse 15, it is interesting to note there, it gives a very explicit statement um, uh, with regard to this idea of the church, how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. And so that is kind of a a thesis statement of really the whole of the letter for Paul to write his first uh, correspondence to uh, Timothy regarding the church itself that Timothy was to be a leader of. And so we come just to the first two verses by way of introduction uh, this evening. I want us to consider this question. I've already referenced it. I'll say it again. How are we to think of ourselves uh, or how are we to think of the church that we attend or go to? How, many different ways you might uh, manifest that particular question. How are we to think of ourselves as the church? How should we think or view the church that we are a part of? Well, let me read these first two verses by way of introduction and, um, and then ask the Lord to help us understand that which Paul begins to give us instruction even this night. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, help us as we would take time to look at these first couple of verses this night to this letter that Paul wrote Um, to give instruction to Timothy as one who would be a leader in the local body of Christ. And so I pray that we, as a local body of Christ, would hear what is said, not just in these verses, certainly tonight, but in the coming weeks, that we would uh, be eager and anticipate what we might learn from Paul's instruction in this particular letter to Timothy. Help us, we pray, by your Spirit, we long to hear well, uh, but we admit, Father, that we are prone to wander even when we hear the word of God read and proclaimed. So help us by your spirit, that your spirit would be active and alive in the midst of this, your congregation gathered even this night. We pray this to the end. Ultimately, we, your children, part of your church, would bring greater glory to you, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the spirit. We pray this In Jesus' name, amen. So we have here in this introduction, um, as you think about these words of greeting and kind of run through them generally speaking, but I want you to see uh, four things that we can learn by the example and remind us is supposed to understand what the church is to be like. And we want to hear Paul's dear, kind words 
in these particular greetings, and they are intended, even in the introduction to Timothy himself, to be for us some of the fundamental tenets, if you will, of a description of the church, for that matter, in understanding herself. First thing that we want to note is that the church is established by God. The church is established by God. You say, but where is that? Well, you want to draw attention to Paul's few words there as he uh, himself describes that this is a God-appointed ministry. Right there at the beginning, verse 1, it's vital for Timothy as one who would go out to start a church, to go out and be involved in local church, to go out and be in ministry. It's vital for Timothy to understand that God has appointed Paul to be a leader in the church. It was God who is also appointing Timothy to be a leader in the church, tasked him with this ministry. It is not the church, think about this, it's not the church that ultimately appoints us to ministry. Let me clarify that for a moment. We have officers, for example, here. Uh, We hope to have more coming in the next uh, few months. Elders and deacons and even myself in the course of those who have already been made officers or a pastor here have been voted on by this congregation in order that they might be the leaders at the local church. You affirm God's calling to us in serving you, the officers that are here and the ones, Lord willing, that will come forward. You, however, do not ultimately call us. What I mean God's the one that calls us. That's what Paul is here saying. God uses the church to call, but it's the God himself who's the one who appoints those who are called to ministry. That's the language there. An apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus himself. Paul is pointing out to Timothy that very point as he uses these words. He's stressing that the ministry of the Christian church is according to the command of God. It's according to the command of God. Now, it seems strange for Paul to to open his letter, one he is writing to a dear brother that he loves dearly, uh, with a rather formal, uh, firm, stiff uh, opening uh, to this letter to his gospel friend and gospel ministry, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Uh, They were closer than this, it seems, and yet this is how he begins this letter to Timothy. You might have expected, dear Timothy, how are you doing or something of that sort. You might think it would be a little warmer at the front end of this letter writing to one he spent many years already together in ministry. But Paul has a method to what he's doing here. Paul is reminding Timothy, though you might not know it upon just reading it very quickly through, he's reminding Timothy that Paul's own authority does not come from the church, but rather but from God himself. And that Timothy's authority ultimately comes from the Lord himself, by the command of God himself. Paul is not an apostle because he knew the right people. He was not an apostle because he was ambitious and worked hard, that he had worked his way up some kind of uh, ecclesiastical ladder, Um, because he was smarter than anyone else, although he probably was. Paul is an apostle because one day he was on the way to Damascus killing Christians, and Jesus met him there. And he said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Paul, I'm going to show you how much you will suffer for my sake. Paul was called to gospel ministry by Christ, literally, in his case, by Jesus directly himself. But we want to comprehend and grasp that all true Christian ministry, those who are in it, are called ultimately by Christ. It is affirmed by the church. It is put forth by and made confirmation by the church. But we want to remember who's the one who's establishing his church. If you think it was me that established this church, if you think it was me that put myself in this position, we've got that wrong. 
If it is also the understanding of the officers who serve here that you are good enough to have made yourself into that place. No, it is God's hand that has orchestrated and put these things together. That's the first thing that we must think about. That God himself is the one who established his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He is one who put together the book of Acts for us to see the, the, the majesty and beauty and complexity of how is it that these churches just showing up at all over these places. Yes, he's using people. Yes, he's using leaders. But he's the one who puts those leaders in the place that they are in. The success of any ministry, the success of any church depends not upon the man, the officer, the one who's there in positions of leadership. It's God who's decided this is what's going to happen. It's God's church, and he's the one who puts those in place. Now, you may be in your mind thinking, well, what about all those that are there, but they're not really of God? Well, ultimately, God is controlling that as well. But we're primarily talking about the order and understanding of the nature of the church. Too oftentimes, uh, particularly over time, there's a notion that it's my church. If you've ever been around churches that have any age to them, because uh, they've been there long enough and they're longer than most pastors and they're longer, you know, you get the idea. Now, that's, that's missing the fundamental view that Paul is seeking to convey to his brother, his understudy. It is God who has appointed leaders in his church, and we, not, need not, we cannot lose sight of that. For when we begin to do that, it becomes a human institution, not established by anyone less that individual human being. It's God's church, God's established it, God's going to keep it going, and God is placing those in positions of leadership. First point that we need to understand, but it may seem obvious, but we need to move on. The church depends on a clear understanding of who God is. It seems obvious, but as you realize, this is a full-packed introduction here that Paul is writing. And so you begin to see in verses 1 and 2, that you have a God conscious ministry. What I mean by that, Paul is exceedingly conscious of the one who has called him into service, but also who he is and what he's like. So he's very aware that it was God who put him in to this role or this position of leadership. But more than that, he goes on to say, I know who he is. I know what he is like. As you began to look at these particular verses the ministry of the christian church in fact depends upon a clear comprehension of who god is paul stresses four things god is savior jesus is the messiah who is our hope god is father jesus the messiah is lord that's the very things he's describing here with regard to this one who he is describing god our savior christ our hope God the Father and Christ the Lord. Do you understand that that's, that's the sum and substance, if you will, if you could summarize what must we first know about the one who's placed Paul in leadership, the one who's placed any one of us who are in any leadership capacity in the church. We need to know who he is and what he is like. And so he has these, these various statements about the one who's placed him in leadership. God is Savior. You see, we don't just need to know stuff. We need to understand that we've been forgiven. That's the, the understanding of what God's business is all about, that He is the one who is the Savior. We don't need to just know that He is kind and benevolent and loving and, and in all of those ways that so many people, again, who have been around church long enough, they begin to be muddled over the generations of who is this that we've come to serve. He is the one who is the Savior, the one who's forgiven sins. That's where Paul begins in his acknowledgement of who God is as Savior, conscious of these things, coming to serve a God who saves people. That God is our Savior. The church, in this regard, we don't uh, maybe hear about this in broader terms, and yet. We need to not ever lose sight. And yet so many churches over the course of their uh, evolution, if you will, as a church in its existence, slowly over time, sin goes away. 
coming and talking and speaking of these things. Unless the Lord brings, it goes in terms of a conversation and communication about this. Well, guess what? If sin goes out of the pulpit, God is no longer needed as Savior. Because there's no reason that you would need a Savior if there's no sin. And so that's what Paul starts here. God is our Savior. Crossing God, his own son. That's the heartbeat of where Paul begins and presses in on Timothy to understand. Lest you forget, God is Savior. That is the fundamental, primary view of who you serve. God as Savior. He goes on. He calls him Jesus, our hope. Second thing you see there. And throughout the New Testament, it speaks about this blessed hope that we all have. Of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15. If our hope is in this life only. If our hope is in this life only. We of all men are most miserable. So the great thing that we as Christians look forward to. Is the coming of our Lord. So not only is God Savior. But Jesus is our hope. The hope of resurrection. The ultimate culmination of the, the kingdom of eternity. That we will spend Forever, This is the very person and work of Christ. And so as we look to his coming, that's where our hope is to be wrapped up in. There's nothing in this life that will be lasting hope. There's nothing that we can set our sights on. We all know it to be true. If I just had that, I'm hopeful that if I obtain this, it will then. And then we find getting it that it doesn't do the very thing that we want. It's only in Christ will our hope be the ultimate satisfaction, the great thing that we are looking forward to. So our hope is wrapped up in that, and that's why Paul is ministering light of the very uh, uh, thoughtfulness of that, how God is Savior, but also how Christ is our hope. These are the two things he begins with, but he goes on, he doesn't stop there. He speaks of God as, uh, who is my Father. You can't call God Father unless you know His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who's brought us into the very presence of the Heavenly Father. He's no longer the one that uh, is just judging our sins, but rather we come unto the Father. So again, we're trying to take from this introduction his view, uh, right view, of who God is. That's what the church should be about. Never neglecting who is God and what is he like. His Father Jesus is uh, to be our uh, brother in order to understand rightly that God is our Father. Our Father, if we have embraced Christ in the gospel, you can begin to understand that to know him savingly is to turn unto him and to realize, I I can't do anything to justify myself to my Father. I can't deny my sin I can't make up some kind of way that I can be good enough to be accepted by God but if I've come in the very merits of my brother the Lord Jesus Christ that is the one who is my hope then I come to realize he's my father that's how I've been made a part of the family by trusting in Christ alone for salvation and so you see this ministry that, that Paul is commending to Timothy. He begins to describe the very sum and substance of what we need to be about. Knowing God is our Savior and Christ is our hope. And that we understand that the, He is our Father. But he lastly just mentions that the church in viewing our God concludes that God is our Lord, that Christ is our Lord. Jesus is our Lord. He's not merely a Savior. He's the Lord of heaven and earth, the one who rules over the church, the one who's preeminent in all things. So, so you, you, you ask yourself, I ask myself, as the head of a local church in terms of being the pastor, are these things that which we emphasize? Are these things that we speak about? That we might encourage people, certainly convict those who do not know Christ as the uh, one who is our brother. Because then they wouldn't know God as Father. That's a lot that could be said, more can be said about what the church should be speaking on in terms of who is God, having a right comprehension of God. But that's a very good summary that we have here in the introduction of Paul to Timothy. The third thing, Christ is to have a ministry of encouragement. You look there at verse 2, 
and you see grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. Example here from him as he introduces his letter, his encouraging words to Timothy, genuinely giving him a greeting, uh, encouraging him, Timothy, my true child in the faith. As you begin to realize what he's doing here, the ministry of the Christian church is to be one of spiritual encouragement. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have heard from Paul uh, that he has considered him a true child of, uh, of his in the faith? That would have been a great encouragement for Timothy to hear. Listen to how he's described me, my true child in the faith. Can you imagine how wonderful that is? And friends, we, we have such an understanding of this as well, that we might encourage one another. Because what else can you say to each other that will encourage one another more than speaking of that which they have in Christ? That your faith has been given to you by Christ. We can try to encourage them by, you know, tomorrow will be a better day. It may not, actually. Uh, you can say all kinds of things to try to encourage people. But one thing you can say that will give ultimate encouragement to each other is to say, continue in the faith, for it is Christ alone who will take you all the way home. That is the most encouraging thing we can say to one another. And that's what Paul was about. And so we need to remember that. That we, as the church, just as Paul began his letter here to Timothy, need to realize that we can be an encouragement to one another. The part of the body, um, faith uh, that has been given to you, encouraging one another in the very ministry that you're about. Lastly, I would just mention this from this introduction. The church will minister from the resources granted it by the Father through Christ. You say as you look at these words, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord, Paul is pointing to Timothy to the resources of what is really Christian encouragement. Timothy, my true son in the Lord, now hear where you need to look for your resources, to grace, to mercy, and to the peace of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. How does that encourage Timothy? It points, it points Timothy to the attributes of God in one sense. On the one hand, he's our Savior, he's our hope, he's our Father, he's our Lord. But also by pointing to the provisions that God gives. He gives you grace. He gives you mercy. He gives you peace. That's what Paul's saying to Timothy. That's what we should say to each other. This is the very one that is, we serve, God himself, full of grace and mercy and peace. And yet you see the Christian church is, is utterly dependent upon these resources that are given to us by the Father in Christ. We don't have the power to do what God has called us to do as the local body of Christ, apart from the very provision that God gives us. The task that the Lord has given us is impossible for us as a church to accomplish. What is our task? To raise the dead. That's our task, to heal all those who are wounded. Because basically, if we're given the Great Commission, we're sent out to say, go and bring the gospel to those who are dead. And how good would we do this of our own abilities? That's where, again, we look to the grace and mercy and peace of God himself, the one who is able to raise the dead, the one who graciously gave his son and mercifully was kind to us. As we think about that, as we go out to share good news, as we think about the, the task of the local church in some ways, apart from the work of God's grace and by his mercy, will anyone ever come to know the peace of the Lord? And so it's not only his character, but it's his provision of giving us the very things that are of his nature, grace, mercy, and peace. Because no one has ever thrown a life preserver to a dead person and they grasped it. Because they can't hold on to it because they're not alive. We are needing God's grace and mercy and peace, not only for those that we would seek to minister to, but for ourselves as well. The very provision of God that he gives me not what I deserve, mercy. He bestows on me kindness that is full of the abundance that I, again, 
am unworthy of, his grace and his mercy. The very peace that I have that comes certainly in the knowledge of Christ is something that he's bestowed upon us. So as we think on these things, what is the church, to, how is she to think about ourselves? Well, we've mentioned these things. We always need to remember it's God himself who's established his church. How discouraging that is for church plants, for established churches, wherever you may be. If you believe it's all on you to get the church going, that's a wrong view of how you should view the church. It's God who builds his church. It's God who starts his church. It's God who holds his church and keeps his church going. And when you have a church that's going, don't think it's uh, you. It must be God until the spirit has been taken away and they have enough money they don't need God. But that's not what I'm talking about. It is God himself who builds the church. Let us never forget that. As we labor together as the body of Christ, he is the one who's established his church and even this ministry here. We need to not take our eyes off of him. Just as in this introduction, Paul wanted Timothy to look at God. And to think about God as our Savior and our hope and our Father. And that would give great encouragement in the ministry to understand and trust in the resources that He alone can provide to do the very things that we can't do on our own by His grace, by His mercy, giving His peace to establish and build and lift up His church for the glory of Christ itself. May we remember these things that Paul wanted Timothy to understand as he started his letter to him. Let's pray. Help us, Father. We know that uh, you're the one that builds your church, and you're the one that we must look unto in remembering who you are and your very nature and your way with us. We have our hope in Christ. You are our Savior, O oh God, because you sent your Son, Christ, and you are the one that is our Father that has made us children of yours through our brotherly comprehension of Christ himself. So may we here at our church always remember, always remember that you're the one that established this church. Let us never forget it. For often it is the case, sadly, that the longer one is a church, that we move away from these very basic tenets of the truth of what Paul wanted Timothy to comprehend. We bless you. We thank you for your instruction to us even this night and throughout this day. We praise you and give thanks to you. In Christ's name, amen. 411, shout for the blessed Jesus reigns. 411.
Receive God's blessing as you go. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you now, even all the way unto eternity. Amen.